If you watch the interviews I did with Neil Hurley regarding the attacks of the Cape Florida Lighthouse, he referenced two letters that were written by Keeper John W. B. Thompson, and we never read those, and so I would like to read one of those right now. On July 23, 1836, the Cape Florida Lighthouse was attacked by a band of Indians who sought revenge on the white man. The following letter describes the attack as written immediately after by the keeper of the lighthouse to the editor of the Charleston Courier. A copy of this letter appears in Graphic Accounts of American Escapes in the Yale Library and in the Miami Herald, Miami, Florida, April 7, 1935. On the 23rd of July last, about 4 p.m., as I was going from the kitchen to the dwelling place of the Cape Florida Lighthouse, I discovered a large body of Indians within 20 yards of me back of the kitchen. I ran for the lighthouse and called to the old Negro man that was with me to run, for the Indians were near. At that moment, they discharged a volley of rifle balls, which cut my coat and hat and perforated the door in many places. When we got inside, as I was turning the key in the door, the savages had hold of the door. I had stationed the old man at the door with orders to let me know if they attempted to break in. I then took my three muskets, which were loaded with ball and buckshot, and went to the second window. Seeing a large body of Indians near the dwelling house, I discharged my muskets in succession among them, which put them in some confusion. They then for the second time began their horrid yells, and in a minute no glass or sash was left in the window, for they had vented their rage at that spot. I fired at them from some of the other windows and from the top of the lighthouse. In fact, I fired wherever I could get an Indian for a mark. I kept them from the lighthouse until dark. Then they poured in a heavy fire at all the windows and into the big lantern at the top of the lighthouse. That was the time they set fire to the door and the window which were even with the ground. The window was boarded up with plank and filled with stone inside, but the flames sp spread fast, being fed with yellow pine wood. Their musket balls had perforated the tin tanks of oil, consisting of 225 gallons. My bedding, clothing, and in fact everything I had was soaked in oil. I stopped at the door until driven away by the flames. I then took a keg of gunpowder, my musket balls, and one musket to the top of the lighthouse. Then went below and began to cut away the stairs about halfway up from the bottom. I had a difficulty getting the old man up the space I had already cut, but the flames now drove me from my labor and I retreated to the top of the lighthouse. I covered over the scuttle which led to the lantern, which kept the fire from me for some time, but at last the awful moment arrived when there was the crackling of flames burning around me. The savages at the same time began their hellish yells. My poor old man looked over at me with tears in his eyes, but could not speak. We went out to the lantern and lay down on the edge of the platform, two feet wide. The lantern was now full of flames. The lamps and glasses were bursting and flying in all directions. My clothing was on fire, and to move from the place where I was would be instant death from the Indians' rifles. My flesh was roasting, and to put an end to my horrible sufferings, I got up, threw the keg of gunpowder down the scuttle, instantly exploded, and shook the tower from the top to the bottom. It had not the desired effect, however, of blowing me into eternity, but it threw down the stairs and all the woodwork near the top of the house. It damped the fire for a moment, but it soon blazed up as fierce as ever. The old man said he was wounded, which was the last words he spoke. By this time I had received some wounds myself, and finding no chance for my life, for I was roasting alive, I took the determination to jump off. I got up went outside the iron railing, recommending my soul to God, and was on the point of going head foremost onto the rocks below, when something dictated to me to return and lie down again. I did so, and in two minutes the fire fell to the bottom of the lighthouse. It is a remarkable circumstance that no wet rifle or musket ball struck me when I stood up outside of the railing, although they were flying around me like hailstones. I found the old man dead, being shot in several places and literally roasted. A few minutes after the fire fell, a stiff breeze sprung up from the southward, which was a great blessing to me. I had to lie where I was, for I could not walk, having received six rifle balls, three in each foot. The Indians, thinking me dead, left the lighthouse and set fire to the dwelling house, kitchen, and other outhouses, and began to carry their plunder to the beach. 
They took all of the empty barrels, the drawers from the bureaus, and in fact, everything that would act as a vessel to hold anything. My provisions were in the lighthouse, except for a barrel of flour, which they took off. The next morning, they hauled out of the lighthouse, by means of a pole, the tin that composed the oil tanks, no doubt to make the grates to manufacture the kunti root into what we call arrowroot. After loading my little sloop, about 10 or 12 went in that, and the rest took to the beach to meet at the other end of the island. That happened, as I judge, about 10 a.m. My eyes being much affected prevented me from knowing their exact force, but I judge they were from 30 to 40, perhaps more. With them gone, I was now as bad off as before. I had a burning fever on me, my feet were shot to pieces, I had no clothes to cover me, nothing to eat or drink, a hot sun overhead, a dead man at my side, and no friend or any expect. And placed between 70 and 80 feet from the earth with no chance of getting down, my situation was truly horrible. About noon, I thought I could perceive a vessel not far off. I took a piece of the old man's trousers that had escaped the flames because of being wet with his blood and made a signal. Sometime in the afternoon, I saw two boats with my sloop in tow coming to the landing. I had no doubt, but they were the Indians, having seen my signals and returned to finish their murderous designs. But they proved to be the boats from the United States schooner Motto in charge of Captain Armstrong and a detachment of seamen and mariners under the command of Lieutenant Lloyd of the sloop of war Concord. They had retaken my sloop after the Indians had stripped her of sails and rigging and everything of consequence belonging to it. The rescuers informed me they had heard of my explosion 12 miles off and had run down to my assistance, but didn't expect to find me alive. Those gentlemen did all in their power to relieve me, but night was coming on, so they returned to the motto, after assuring me of their assistance in the morning. Next morning, three boats landed, among them the schooner Pody from New York, Captain Cole. They had made a kite during the night to get a line to me, but without effect. They then fired a twine from their muskets, made fast to a ramrod, which I received. I could then haul up a tail hook and made fast around an iron stanchion, put the twine through the block, and they below, by that means, sent a two-inch rope and hoisted up two men who soon landed me on terra firma. I must state here that the Indians had made a ladder by lashing pieces of wood across a lightning rod near 40 feet from the ground as if to have my scalp. After I got on the motto, every man from the captain to the cook tried to alleviate my sufferings. Three days later, I was received in the military hospital through the politeness of Lieutenant Alvord of the 4th Regiment of the United States Infantry. He had done everything to make my situation as comfortable as possible. I must not admit here to return west, generally for their sympathy and kind offers of anything that I would wish that it was in their power to bestow. Before I left Key West, two musket balls were extracted, and one remains in my right leg. But since I am under the care of Dr. Ramsey, who has paid every attention to me, he will know best whether to extract it or not. These lines were written to let my friends know I am still in the land of the living, and am now in Charleston, South Carolina, where every attention is paid to me. Although a cripple, I can eat my allowance and walk without the use of a cane. Yours very respectively, John W.B. Thompson.